Hey, welcome to the reigning clan from 16 to 1800. In this video, I'm going to show you two games that I played. Both were actually with black. The first one is the Scandinavian. So you're going to get to see yet another Scandinavian. And then the second one is against the English. And so you're going to see the system that I play um, against the English. And so stick around if you're interested in that. But let's get started. All right, so the first game we were playing against the 1718, and we had, like I said, the Scandinavian defense. I played my normal knight of six move. The idea is to recapture with the knight instead of the queen so that we don't lose a tempo on our queen when they play knight c3. And so now we can trade and we kind of get the same position except these knights are gone. So um, then we have d4, knight to c6. So I'm developing a piece and attacking the pawn. And then he defends it. And then bishop g4, same kind of idea, developing a piece and also creating the pin here, attacking this and putting more pressure uh, on this d4 pawn. And now white plays bishop to e2, and this is pretty common in the Scandinavian defense. It almost looks like I can win a pawn because I have two attackers. He's got two defenders, but I can remove one of the defenders. And so now you think, all right, I can just take the free pawn. Actually doesn't work. If I try to do that and take here, I'm actually losing my queen because he can capture the knight with check and then the queen's undefended and he just takes it. So it doesn't actually work, uh, but that's good to be aware of. So I went ahead and castled queenside. What I like about this move is that, number one, it gets my king out of the center, uh, but also it puts the rook immediately on a half open file. And so this pawn has a lot of pressure right away. And now the threat that I was talking about before where he can capture here with check, you know, no longer exists. So. Just straightforward moves, developing, castling, and, and attacking, you know, weaknesses. And so c3 is a good move. He just defends it. And then I played e5, you know, and opening up the center is totally fine. It's actually a good thing because his king is still in the center and mine is not. And so it's also just a relatively straightforward move. Let's out the bishop. Um, so I can develop that later. And puts more pressure on that d4 square. So he played bishop to e3, defending it. And now I played e4, and what I was thinking here was most likely he's going to castle kingside. He didn't have to. He could move his queen and castle queenside, but then he's already got this weakness here because this pawn's pushed forward. And so if he castles here, what I can do then is play like f5, maybe h6, g5, f4, and you know attack the bishop and also create a pawn storm on his king. And so I was kind of planning ahead for that by playing this move. Also... If he's able to trade off this pawn, this bishop could become pretty active and, and maybe be annoying on my queen side over here. And so I thought, you know, by pushing this forward, his bishop's not really uh, doing a whole lot here. And so that's kind of what I was thinking. So he played back, I traded off um, the bishop and then f5. So just kind of following through with my plan, he did castle. And now, I'm trying to think, okay, how do I proceed from here? I still have to develop this bishop. So there's, you know, I can't go here, I can't go here, I can't go here. So there's really two options. I can go bishop e7 or bishop d6. And bishop d6 looks really nice because for one, I'm going on this diagonal, attacking the, the king side, but also it makes uh, f4 become a possibility. And then the bishop is trapped, right? Can't go anywhere. So if I get that move in, I just win a piece. The issue with this move that I was concerned about is that if I play there, he could play c4, and then my queen's under attack, and it looks like then maybe he could follow it up with d5, I have to move my knight, then he could play c5, I have to move my bishop, and all of a sudden he got like one, two, three pawn moves for free, because he's chasing my pieces around, and then he's, you know, going to probably push them forward again and open up my king, and the rooks are going to come over, it looked pretty risky, so I did play this move, by the way, but when I played it, that's my my concern, right? That's what I was worried about. And so one thing, when you're playing chess and you have an idea and you have a plan and it looks like it might not work for a particular reason, like in this case, it looks like maybe my plan of going here and playing f4 isn't going to work because this is just going to destroy my, my king. What you want to do is see if there's a tactic that you can find that makes that move, you know, not possible for your opponent. So what I mean by that is like, if he plays c4, do I have any tactics available to me that I can play that are going to like make that a bad move? Okay, so I actually noticed that there was a little tactic here. I could take this with my knight. The idea being it's attacking his queen. And so if he takes my queen, well, then I'm just going to take his queen. And so that's what I uh, actually played in the game. He did play um, 
C4, and then I captured it with the knight. And so I had I saw that tactic when I played bishop d6. If I didn't see that or if that wasn't available, then I probably would have played a different move. Um, but because that was available, I knew that like, hey, if you play c4, I'm just going to do this, and we're going to be good. I just won the pawn, and um, you know, nice little little trick here. So he decided to not trade the queens, and he decided to just take this. So I took it, um, and then we have knight here. I have to move the queen somewhere, so I went back here because it just makes sense to line up, create the battery, you know, threaten checkmate, and then we have g3, and so. Moving a pawn in front of the king obviously creates weaknesses here, so I can't take advantage of that immediately. Uh, but in the future, if I'm able to play f4, f3, maybe bring the queen over here, there could be a checkmate on g2 that's, that's possible because of this. So that's one thing that I was thinking through. And then I also, this rook really is the only piece that's not doing a lot. So this rook is pretty nice. It's on an open file, which is where you want rooks to be. These pieces are lined up on the king side. Now it's Kind of blockaded here by with this you know these pawns but they're still relatively active the queen is in a nice centralized square so the only piece left that's really not doing anything is this rook and so with that in mind i played h5 the idea is i want to go h4 and once i capture then guess what this rook is now on a half open file on my opponent's king so seemed like a good plan and that's what i went for c5 uh you know he's, he's giving away a pawn he's trying to open up um you know the file for his rooks and so it makes sense but i felt like i was in a good position to defend i could easily bring this up if i needed to my queen is also going to be doing a good job so i was okay just taking that and then he did bring a rook over and i played queen to d6 and so so basically here i'm just trying to keep control of this file uh, maybe i have ideas of coming down here and, and getting control of the second rank um, and also it defends this square right he's already lined up on it once most likely he's going to maybe proceed with a queen move later and threaten checkmate so i figured hey let's go ahead and defend it right now and you know seemed like a good place for the queen so that's why i went there i also considered queen b6 uh, but decided that you know what this open file looked pretty nice so he does play here so he's going to double up rooks and then i played h4 and the reason i went ahead and continued over here is i'm not worried about this because i have c6 right i can just play c6 it's defended by a pawn What's he gonna do? Like sacrifice both of his rooks? I mean, it, it's fine. So, continued with the plan, and then I did play c6. Okay, so then we have b4. He's gonna go here, capture this, and then I do have to figure out how I'm gonna defend. But before that happens, I have my own attack, right? I'm gonna open up this rook, I'm gonna bring this pawn in, and so mine is a little bit faster, and so I went ahead and continued with the plan. Captured here. He took back, and now at this point, um, you know, this pawn is hanging. It's a little bit risky to take it because it does open up another uh, half open file on my king. But um, I noticed that like his king is kind of open here. So I'm going to be able to move my queen with check and not have to lose a temple there. And so I figured it was okay to take it. So I captured the pawn. He did bring the rook over and then I went there uh, with check. And so this is important because like, let's say just I make a random move like you know, something that's not checked. Like maybe I just go back to D6. The issue with that is I'm losing a little bit of time. Like now he has time to do something, whether that's bring this rook here, double up on this file or move his queen somewhere. He has time to do something. Whereas when I go here, he, he can't, he's gotta get that check. So I basically saved myself a move by doing that. So King H1 and then Queen D3. And the idea is I'm up two pawns, which is significant in an end game. If you're up two, or, sorry, three pawns. I have six, he has three. Uh, you're up three pawns most likely you're gonna win the end game. So by offering the queen trade, I'm like, I'm happy if we can trade queens. And it's not really easy for him to avoid the queen trade. I mean, he could he could move here or maybe g2, but even then I have queen f3 to force the trade. It, this is gonna be a strong move if he moves his queen away from that diagonal. So really he, he has to probably trade queens. And so he played king g2 and I just traded it off. Now we just have an end game where I'm very comfortable being up several pawns. So just kind of straightforward moves, defending the uh, what he was attacking, putting my rooks on the open file, and now I'm just starting to control the ranks that I want controlled. So this is the base of my pawn chain, so I want to put a rook there to defend it. And then same thing here, seventh rank, 
or the second rank um, is very dangerous if you let your opponent control it. And so I'm taking back control of that to force his rook to either trade, which is fine with me, or move off of that rank. So he did move off, and then I could bring my king up and just continue to kind of push the pawns forward, being careful to, you know, defend the weaknesses. And he resigned here. And it's basically, you know, these pawns are going forward. He can't really stop that. I'm probably going to go here, trade off another pair of rooks, and go on to win. Okay, so here's game number two. We played against an 1829, so a little bit out of the range, but pretty close. And like I said, we had an English opening. So against the English, I like to play e5, and then knight c3 is by far the most common move. And I like to play the immediate bishop to b4. Now, if they don't play knight c3 and they play g3 first, uh, you can't play this opening. You have to do something else. But most people play knight c3. And so I play bishop to b4. And the idea is I'm going to trade off my bishop, give them doubled pawns, and then put all my pawns on dark squares and make their bishop somewhat ineffective. I talked about this in my video on uh, top 10 middle game plans. This is one of the plans when you play this opening that you go for. You, you trade off that dark squared bishop, put all your pawns there, and then, and then like I said, this bishop is kind of ineffective. So that's the idea. Um, he played g3, and so I just kind of followed through, traded that off, and developed the knights. You know, if your pawns are going to be like this, then this is the most logical um, position for the knights. Sorry, right here and here. So I'm just kind of you know, following through. And, and this, I don't like this move because f6 is relatively obvious move. I think he would have been better to just continue on developing his knight, pushing this pawn maybe forward, doing something else. Um, I don't really like that move because he just kind of wasted a, a tempo there. Then I castled, rook to b1, and I played b6. And so exactly like I talked about at the beginning, that's what I do. And, you know, you can see this bishop, like, what's he going to do? Now, this move is a little bit risky because there's a bishop here um, lined up on my rook, attacking my knight. But there are a couple things uh, that make it okay to play this move. Number one, my king is not over here, right? If this was my king side, I would be much more leery to play a move like that, right? Like if my king was sitting right here. Um, but king is fine. The next thing is, can he take advantage of this? If you, you know, if you're going to play a move like this, you want to make sure you look carefully does something bad going to happen? So for example, if he played queen a4, am I losing a piece now because my knight's pinned, I can't move it, and am I in big trouble? Well, no, I could play bishop to b7, and then if I had to later play knight a5, which defends bishop, probably he's going to trade off here. That would be totally fine. I could even play bishop d7, queen e8 to defend some of these light squares. I have answers. It's not, there's no tactics that are going to happen. So because of that, um, I can get away playing a move like this. So Bishop to a3, rook to b8, and so I wanted to get out of this pin because I want to use my knight. The plan that I like to go for is attacking this c4 pawn, uh, and so knight a5, bishop a6, just to pile up on that weak pawn is the idea. And so e3, I followed through, knight a5, a5, and then we have c5. And this is kind of a critical moment in the game. So, you know, first of all, if I just do sort of, let's just say a random kind of a wasteful move like king h8, he's going to take here and he's fixed his pawn structure. So his pawn structure looks great now. He's going to be able to just push these forward. He has no real uh, weaknesses. He's also created an active bishop now. He's attacking this pawn, which is now my queen is kind of babysitting this pawn. He's got other targets here. Really nice position for white. And in, in just one, you know, kind of wasted move here, that's going to happen. So I can't do that. And, um, you know, the goal is I would like to keep these pawns doubled so that I have targets and I have compensation for giving away um, the bishop pair. So what I decided to do was capture it because when he takes back here, then he still has the doubled pawns. Now, he actually could take here with the bishop because there's this pin on my rook. Uh, it gets a little tricky because then I have like bishop f5, which attacks the rook, also defends my rook so that this threat comes you know, back, and so it's not that simple. Um, but that was a move. Um, I didn't actually see that in the game. I overlooked that, but he did capture it this way, and so we ended up, you know, getting the double pawns like I was trying to keep. And then we have knight to c4, and the idea here is that, you know, again, I don't want to just let him simply capture here, and then his bishop is all of a sudden very strong. So by playing knight c4, I'm forcing him to make a decision here. If he tries to move the bishop, like let's say here, I have a5, and it's trapped. 
And then if he goes back to, to uh, c1, well then I was just going to probably play b5. My knight is now defended nicely, and this bishop is terrible, right? And so that's kind of the, the plan from the start of this game that we've been going for. So that was the idea, and then he played a move that I wasn't really expecting, queen to b3, which actually was a big mistake. And the, the big mistake behind that move is that he let the square... Um, become undefended. Like right now, my queen can't go there, his queen would just take me. But as soon as he plays queen to b3, he gives up control of this file. Nothing is defending the square. And so that's what I went for, queen to d2 check. So king f1, and the obvious benefit from that move is that his king cannot castle, but also it puts my queen in a very active space. And I noticed there was a little tactic here that if I played queen to d3 and he blocked with the knight, well, actually, that's what he played. I'll give you guys a second What's the move that black plays to win? And it's not like win like a checkmate, but it wins a lot of material. Go ahead and take a few seconds, see if you can find it. Black to play and win material. <clears throat> well, yeah, if you said queen takes b1 check, you are correct. So um, there's a little knight fork here. And so by giving up the queen for the rook, puts him into that position. We can come in with the knight. This would happen in the game. And then we take the queen. And we even have the bonus that it's attacking the bishop over here. So he's got to deal with that. So he moves the bishop. And essentially, we just want a rook. Um, if he was somehow able to trap the knight, we would still have won the exchange, which is still good. Um, but there's there's ways to just save the knight. And so you're going to see that. I brought the rook over, just trying to come down. Remember, when you're up material, trading pieces going into the end game is the easiest and simplest way to win. And so that's what I did. He played there, he's he's trying to trap the knight. I mean, it is it is trapped basically at the moment, um, but I could move it there because now the rook is defending. But I actually saw this little tactic that was just, in my opinion, easier and, and cleaner. Play check, trade the rooks, and then pin the bishop here. And so he can't um, take it because his king obviously would be in check. So he traded it off and then he just resigned because at this point, I'm just of a rook, right? I just have this extra rook over here. So so that's kind of a good example of how I like to play against the English opening when they play c4. Um, one thing that I would just add on, as it's really good to know, is if they play knight to d5, this is something that a lot of people like to play this move. I guess they feel like it just makes your bishop b4 move look bad. Um, you can play bishop to a5. And most people who are playing white, if they haven't seen this, they'll play b4 because it looks like they're trapping your bishop, right? This is kind of like a Noah's Ark trap where they go here and you lose your bishop. The issue is, as soon as they play b4, you play c6, and you're not actually losing your bishop because you're attacking their knight. So captures, captures, and then this is important. When they take you back, don't take the pawn for free with your queen. You play knight to f6, and the reason you want to play knight to f6 because it stops them from playing e4. This is how I like to play. And usually you get to pretty nice positions. You've got a threat here. You've got this that you can take later. And then you can just castle and, and play normal chess. But just a little good tidbit to know if you are going to try this in a game. Uh, anyway, hope you guys learned something from that and enjoyed those games. Um, I will see you in the uh, rating climb from 1800 to 2000. But as always, thanks for watching. Stay sharp, play smart, and take care.